at CG Church, my name is Trisha, and we are so glad you're here. If it's your first time at SCG, welcome. Please stop by our Welcome Center in the lobby to learn what we're all about and get to know some of our friendly staff and volunteers. There is always plenty going on at SCG that you need to know about. First, we are organizing Surviving the Holiday Seminars for our Divorce Care and Grief Share Ministries. The holiday season can be challenging for those dealing with divorce or the loss of a loved one. But you don't have to face this season alone and we would love to support you during this time. These seminars will equip you with ways to deal with the many emotions you'll face during the holidays, provide tips for surviving social events, and help you discover hope for your future. To register for this event, please check out our events page at scgchurch.org events. Next. For parents of children in kindergarten through fifth grade, we have an exciting opportunity for your kids this holiday season. Our annual Christmas tree lighting event is coming up, and this year we're adding a very special performance by our kids choir. We're thrilled to start the Christmas season with such a fun event, and we'd love for your children to be a part of it. So to register, scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link in our Instagram bio at SCG Kids. Finally, we want to say thank you for generously supporting the work God is doing here at SCG. You can give online or in person at the black offering boxes on your way out. Here at SCG, we believe that serving others is an important part of building our faith and character. So if you are interested in discovering ways that you can serve others here at SCG, we'd love to have you join one of our volunteer teams. Scan the QR code on the screen to help us get you plugged into the right spot. If you need prayer, head over to our prayer and care corner in the lobby. We care about what God is doing in your life and we are ready to pray for you. There's always a lot going on here at SCG that you can be a part of. So stay up to date on the latest events by checking out all the tables on the courtyard, following us on our social media pages, and visiting us on our website, scgchurch.org. Hello, SCG family. It looks like you're ready to worship. Come on and stand up. If you're at home and you're watching, come on and worship with us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Just of God.
But it's so good to continue in worship and know that we serve a great and mighty God that goodness never fails. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am today we come and we sing of your goodness you are good that's who you are that's your character you are good and because you are good you are good to us we are grateful for your character for your goodness and we are grateful for your character being lived out in your blessings to us and today we gather in your name to say thankful that we are thankful that we are grateful that you are good all the time everywhere and therefore we have hope, we have joy, we have peace. We have all that we need because you are good. Thank you for being good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's hard to sit down and talk at the same time. Let's try it again. Good morning. That's great. I love it. So glad you're here. This is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, we want to do something very important. If you have served in any branch of the armed services, would you please stand? We just want to say thank you for your service. We know that um, you helped pave the way for our freedom because freedom isn't free. Somebody had to pay and, and so many of you gave so much. And we just want you to know you're not forgotten. You are appreciated. Um, we are truly grateful for you. Thank you for your service. Um, I've been thinking lately, I did a talk a few weeks ago about this kind of this subject and kind of felt like I had a little victory over it and then it kind of haunted me again. And, and um, I, I want to talk to you about how, I don't know, I don't know how you about, uh, feel about what's going on in the world, but it seems like it's a mess. Would that be an understatement? Like a scary mess, maybe even. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how do we um, manage to, to get through uh, a, a very messy time in a very messy world well either being dragged down into anxiety and worry and fear or even just being distracted on some level by what's going on or just closing it all out and saying I don't care uh, which doesn't seem to be the right, right response either. how do we how do we come to grips with what's going on in the world how do we deal with it and uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that today and, and kind of maybe give you some things that, that you can go on. But, um, but first, I want, I want to talk about something we don't, maybe you're not thinking about. Uh, and, and that is this. Anybody ever been in, in cold? I don't mean California cold where it's 50 degrees. I mean like Midwest cold where it's 20 below. You've been in that, right? You ever been cold to the bone? You don't just get cold on the outside. You get cold all the way. And the way you know that is because you go inside and you sit by a fire and you don't get warm for like an hour. Because it's cold all the way to the bone. I want to suggest to you that the environment we're living in, the world we're living in, the doubt, the fear, all this stuff, has infiltrated many of us and kind of caused us to 
be cold a little bit, a little bit cold, either through worry or anxiety or, or just caution or whatever it might be that we have cooled off. You know, our faith is talking about being hot or cold, and, and cold is not good. And, 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 and some of us have cooled a little bit, and it, and it kind of creeps in. You don't even know it's going there. Before you know it, you kinda, you've lost your enthusiasm. You've lost your focus. You, you may have lost a little bit of hope or something. And, and, and yeah, you might make it through, but you're not probably going to be very, very impactful as you're making it through because you're a little cold, a little... A little off. There's a little dissonance in there. You know what I'm saying? There's a little discomfort. There's a little something off because the world isn't right. And it's even more not right than usual. Does anybody identify with that? You watch the news, you watch, uh, hear the commentators all giving their opinion and why it's not right. How do you fix it? Well, today I want us to kind of get close to the fire. Get in a little close to the fire and get warmed up a little bit. You see, it's not about this, it's about this and this. And one of the ways that this and this happens is we come, see the songs we sang weren't just kind of a precursor to the sermon. What happened during those songs and what can happen when we're singing to God, about God, admitting the truth about us, is that um, incredible things can change. Because what happens when you get cold, it's kind of a, I kind of talk about it this way, it's kind of in my spirit. The whole thing's kind of gotten in my spirit a little bit. Instead of being full of God and hope and peace and joy, I get a little bit of the world in my spirit. Does that make sense? And by the world, I mean the stuff going on. And sometimes we just need to stop and we need to warm it up. We need to address our spirit. It's not a new set of information. I'm going to give you plenty of stuff in a minute. I'm going to, I'm going to just unload a dump truck of stuff for your head. But maybe you need to get a little heart stuff. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I heard this song and I asked these guys to do it. And, and I want you to think about what they're saying because if we live differently, we will think differently. And if we think differently, we can react differently. But unfortunately, we're not thinking differently. We're thinking the wrong thoughts. We're thinking about the wrong things. We're focused on the wrong issues. They're issues for real, but that's not where we live. We are focused on the fact that God is God. And then he knows what's going on, whether it's in your life or in the world. And he's still in control, even though it doesn't feel like it at the moment. He is on the throne. And if we think about that, it changes who we are and how we respond. And today I want you to, I want you to get that beyond just your brain. I want you to think about it to the point it gets in your spirit. Are you up for that? Well, you really need it if you're not. And if you are, you're ready. So let's do it. Listen.
and nothing can separate us from the love of God. No mountain, no valley, no nothing can separate me. So I was at church last Sunday, a different church, and and the pastor, African American guy, great great preacher got to certain one point he goes no no you're not getting it you're just not getting it you're not understanding what I'm saying I can tell you're not getting it and he said it over again he kept saying over and over again until they got it here's what I can tell today is you're not getting it you're just not getting it so you got a world that is going down and is in despair and is in war and is trying to find somebody to hate, somebody to blame, somebody to take advantage of. And then you've got Almighty God who could fix everything in your life and in the world and you're still sitting there. You're not getting it. At some point, you see all this stuff is creeping in. It's creeping in. It's in your emotions. You're sitting here in church going, well, I, I don't know. It doesn't feel I don't. Give God a little golf clap. This is Almighty God. He's on the throne. He's got your problems under control. He understands what's happening in the world. He's got a plan. Well, he deserves more than a golf clap. <laughs> so you got to let it get there. You got to think about it so that it not only is in your head, it's in your heart. It changes your view of the world, what can happen, what should happen, what will happen. It's got to get there. And if you can sit there and not move when you hear that message, then you're not getting it. Because if you got it, you'd be standing up with your hands raised with tears running down your face, realizing the Almighty God died for you. And for me, we got to get it. You see, just understanding stuff doesn't get it. You got to understand it. You got to feel it. You got to live it. But you're not going to do it if you just take it in here and give a little golf clap. See, you're like me because you've been affected. You've been affected by the world you're living in. And God says, don't walk around with that on your shoulders. You don't own that. I'll own whatever I need to own. You walk around a victory with the head held high, your hands in the air, praising God and making a difference where you go. You got to get something, people. I love it. So you're sitting there, well, what got into Doyle? Well, Doyle got fed up with living kind of under the circumstances. I decided to climb out from under him. Let God be God and trust him for whatever he wants to do and all that he wants to do, holding nothing back. So if you want to get it, do you want to know God? Do you want to trust God? you got to step into it. I'm going to invite you to stand. You know, let it out. You might even tap your foot. You might even sing out loud. You might even raise your hand. Because God is on the throne. You can be seated if you can. 
I got to tell you, I, I just realized that, I, I, man, uh, we can't live under this stuff. You know what I'm saying? We are, the, we are the light, and the world is dark. We have the light. And if we're hiding under a bushel somewhere because it's a scary place, God is for us. God is for us. We need to step into this thing. This is our chance. This is us. This is us being God's people. That's what it looks like. Okay, I'm a little fired up. All right, here we go. So um, anyway, I just, I just, I'm excited because I think this is our opportunity to tell people the truth because the, the, what they're seeing out there isn't good. It's not bringing any hope to anybody, but there is hope. There is real hope and it's in Jesus. So I, ha- I saw a thing this week and it was a guy who had written a little thing about how to deal with the world when it gets too crazy and you just can't deal with the craziness of the world. And, and his suggestions were kind of good, I guess. And it was like one was uh, just stop, stop watching the news, stop worrying about things you can't affect and just focus in on you and just, just step back and take care of you. And then once you kind of feel better, then you can take care of your family and and once that kind of feels better than you, if you can manage a few other people in the community, that's where you go. And it's kind of go local, really local. And I thought, well, that's, that may not be bad advice, but, but I, I thought you know, he's missing the best part. I have a little granddaughter, and her name is uh, Noelle. And Noelle is just, she is the sweetest thing next to her three uh, cousins. But anyway, she's just the cutest thing in the world. And, uh, and she's, just, she's just so much fun. But when you're holding her, she's done this since she was real little, when you're holding her and something scares her or she sees something she doesn't like, she doesn't try to climb away or make a big fuss. She just kind of gets down and she puts her head right here, right on my chest. She just closes her eyes and goes like this. Just, just gently. At first, I didn't know what she was doing, and then I realized she was afraid of something, and she just went like this. At the end of the passages we're going to talk about today in Romans chapter 8, there is this passage where it says, we've been adopted by God, and now we can call him Abba, Father. You see, the most important thing that that guy missed was not just go local, it was go upward. Turn your heart to God. You see, in the crazy times in the world, we first need to go to God. And Abba is, is not like father, it's, it's daddy. We need to go to God. Say, I, God, right now, it just feels crazy. And when you put your heart in, in, in your head, in that, in that space next to God's heart, several things happen. You feel his embrace, that he loves you, that you are protected, that you are loved. And then you hear his heartbeat. And God's heartbeat is always for hurting people. He always wants to bring healing. He always wants to bring reconciliation. He always wants to bring redemption and peace. And so what we need to do in those times is first call on the lap of our Heavenly Father, put our our head next to His heart, and admit the truth about what we're feeling, what we're seeing, and what we can understand. And in that position, God will fill us with His Spirit. He will change the way we're not only living, thinking, but reacting. If we are to live differently, we are to think differently. And if we think differently, we will react differently. And our reaction, my reaction to many of the issues in the world the last few years has been disappointing to me. And I'm trying to learn how it is to react like Christ would react. Not like someone who is this little wimpy, afraid guy. So let me, let's, let's talk about Romans today. We're in chapters five through eight. Um, now here's the problem. Uh, last night, Cody said that I just kind of handed it out like, uh, like a fire hose and you were supposed to drink it. So here's my question today. You want a drum truck or you want a wheelbarrow? What do you want? What do you, what do you want? I'm hearing dump truck from the brave people in front. People in the back are scared to say wheelbarrow because they got a lunch appointment, but they don't want to miss it. So dump truck it is. All right, so here we go. Um, chapters 5 through 8, I'm going to do every verse and we'll hear six hours. It's not true. I'm going to give a little piece of each of these uh, passages because I think it addresses this. And it, ha- it addresses uh, basically three things. Peace, uh, perseverance, and power. And, and I want to go through each of these chapters, just a little brief section of each one. Let's start with Romans 5, uh, starting in verse 1. Here's what it says. Therefore, since we have been justified, Cody talked about that last week. Justified means me and God are good because of Jesus Christ and what he did. And I've accepted his gift on the cross. I've been forgiven. I am reconciled to my heavenly father. I am justified because of what Jesus did, nothing that I could do. I am justified. I am good with God through faith because I believe that Jesus was who he said he was and did what he said he came to do. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access. By the way, this word access is like, is like you were to go to the, the Oval Office and the assistant to the president would say, come on in and say, okay, Doyle, this is the president, Mr. President, this is Doyle. And, and the president says, by the way, come visit any time and means it. Access means that Jesus takes us to the Heavenly Father and he says, this is your creator. This is Doyle. You have access anytime you want. 
Here is what is amazing. We have peace with God. Uh, grace is important too, but I don't have time to include that. We'll talk about it in a different sermon. Peace with God. By the way, peace with God is the most important thing in life. There are all kinds of things in life we're looking for. The number one thing we're looking for is peace with God. It doesn't say we have peace with all men. The truth is we come to peace with God, you're going to have some people who don't like that because you're going you're to think differently. You're going to react differently. They may not like that. But peace with God is the beginning. It is the foundation of dealing. If the whole world is falling apart, but I have peace with God, I'm good. I'm going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So oh, just save it. I got better stuff coming. It'll be all right. <laughs> you're going to want to clap in a couple minutes here. So if we go on in that passage in verses three through five, he says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. What a dumb thing to do. Why would you glory in your suffering? That's, I want to escape my suffering. I don't want to, do you want to suffer? By the way, this word suffering doesn't just mean physical ailments. It include that. It includes anything that is troublesome, troubling times, difficult times, things that are obstacles in your life or discomfort, anything like that. All of that is included under suffering because, by the way, if I'm at peace with God and God's in control of my life, then when I go through suffering, I know that God knows I'm going through suffering and there has to be a reason for it. To suffer is bad. To suffer for no reason is really bad. But here's what it says. It says, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance. And perseverance, that's the word perseverance here. Isn't like passively going, oh, my life is awful. There's nothing I do. Oh, it's me. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. It is not a passive thing. It's an active thing. Like Jesus went to the cross and suffered. He did it for a reason. If we understand that the troubles in our life come so that we can persevere, we can actively move through them for a reason, it develops something in us. So it goes on. Uh, We know the suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character. Now, this uh, perseverance is, is not only, it also has to do with pressure, external pressure on our lives. If we walk through that pressure and that troubling times, it develops character. Yeah, we all want to be a better person, but I want to give you a little thought on that. What do you take with you into eternity? It says someday we will rule and reign with, with God. You will take with you the character you have developed. So most of us go through life with a minimum of comfort, maximum of pleasure. Uh, the other way around. Yeah, minimum of pleasure. No. Maximum comfort, maximum pleasure, minimum of discomfort. We want to go through what's the easiest way to get through. But when we get to eternity, we... If we have walked through, th- my friend Bruce is sitting back here. He's got a broken arm, I heard. Good job, Bruce. Uh, he was playing with his granddaughter. She was too tough for him. But um, so this week, Bruce and I were working on a, on a, on a machine. And uh, it was, okay, let's be honest. Bruce was working. I was watching. And my grandson was there. And do you know why I asked Bruce to fix a machine and not my grandson? My grandson doesn't know anything about machines. He's never worked on machines before. He's never, he's never drained the oil to look for little uh, metal shavings or anything. He doesn't do anything about it. He's not been through it. When we rule and reign with God, God will use the character we've be- developed by going through difficulties and challenges. He will use those things to develop in our life. And so our suffering is not in vain. Our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. We went some suffering to hope in one sentence. When you are suffering, if you understand that if you are a Christian, you're a Christ follower, that you can have hope because whether it's this day or that day on the other side, there will be a use for the suffering you've been through. It will be not about what you have done, it will be about who you have become. And in this life, and toward that last part where it talks about Abba Father, it also talks about that we were intended in verse, chapter 8, verse I think is about 29, it says that we are to, the whole point of life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We are to become more like Jesus. You don't get there just sitting on the couch watching football. You've got to actively be pursuing some things and you get opposition to that. You become the kind of person who makes it through in dependency on God, in faith, and so you have hope. So we look at the world we live in, it's not without hope. There is hope. As Christians, we live at peace. We understand there's a point to suffering. And then we understand that we can't handle it on our own, that we need the power of God at work in our lives. Here's what it says in verses six through eight. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, that's an important, what happens when an, uh, an addict decides they want to get sober? 
First thing they have to do is to admit they are powerless over their addiction. Is that not true? Right? We're all addicted to stuff, by the way. We all need to recognize we're powerless. But here's what's really hopeful about this. Let me go on. I'll read the rest of it. Remind me to come back to this. If I miss it, raise your hand, okay? Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Two really important things here, okay? One is uh, ungodly and sinners. It's two things. Real quick. This is just a little aside. I'm not charging for this part. Um, the ungodly is about they're not righteous. They're not right with God. And then it says sinners. It's not, they're not even right with each other. See, the godly part is up and down. The other is horizontal. And so Paul is saying they are, they are, they're, not, they're not right in any way. They're not right with God. They're not right with each other. That's the position all of us were. Even the goodness we extended to each other was selfish in some way. We had some angle in it. And he is just pointing out the reality, and it gets worse, by the way, the, the, how far down we were. But this, he says, you, when you were still powerless. What does it mean that I was powerless? It means that I'm now something else. I used to be powerless. Now I'm powerful. But I don't feel powerful. I still struggle. But remember, it's not your power. It's God's power working in you. You are powerless to change yourself. You are powerless to change the world. You are powerless to change all the things you worry about and all the issues you see around you. You were powerless, but now in Christ, you are powerful. Real change can happen because God is at work in us. God can bring change in our life, bring change in our marriage, in our family, our community, even in the world because Christians are powerful in Jesus Christ. Um... So, we can react differently to the issues we see in the world. We can react differently to a world that feels very much out of control, a fallen world. We can react differently because we're at peace with God. We know that we will persevere with his help and that his power is made available to us. Let me just walk that out over the next couple of chapters for you. Um, We can react differently even to our own desires because of these things. Let me read for you, starting in in verse 18 of chapter 6. It says this, we Christians have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. In this section, Paul lays out again that there are two ways to live your life. You're either going to be a a slave to sin or you're going to be a slave to righteousness. And in this section, he talks about what it means to truly be free, to be set free. So I, I saw this thing recently, and it was uh, an ad for a motorcycle rally. And it said, and the tagline was, the sound of freedom. The sound of, I get it, right? Jump on the hog. Is that what they call Harleys? I don't know. Uh, and, 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 and just go, right? And never mind that you have to stop for gas, and kids will be there when you get back home. But, but okay, we got freedom for an hour or two here. Let's just go free. And, and, and it plays into something, an escapism kind of mindset that kind of plays into our conventional vision, which freedom is the thing we want. We all want freedom. But the problem is we don't get the second half. We want freedom from something, but not freedom to something. And we miss the point because the freedom to something is the best part of life. So think about this. If I were to adopt a lifestyle that just kind of, let's just take it to the nth degree, that the open road is freedom. Let's just go with that. If I had chosen that when I was a younger man, just the open road, no responsibilities, no job, no family, nothing, I am free. I would have missed out on the best things in my life. I would have missed out on falling in love. Okay, I jumped in love with my wife. I didn't fall, I jumped. I would have missed out on meeting and loving at least one of my children, the other one I'm still working on. I would have missed out on the very best part of life, which is those little grandkids that call me Papa. That's the very best part. I would have missed that because I was free. You see, I was just free. I would have missed out on my life's calling. I would have missed out on the opportunity to stand and talk to you guys on a pretty regular basis and we grow together and we become more like Jesus and we love our kids together. I would miss out on that because I was free. You see, conventional wisdom about freedom is just dumb. It's just not true. It's a lie. So what we find Paul saying is you can be free from that self-driven, self-providing kind of self-absorption. You can be free from that, and you can be free to, to righteousness, 
to living the way God wants you to live, which is all the things you want. You want love, joy, peace. You want, you want all that stuff. It's all in relationship to him. It goes on in verses um, 19 and 21 and 22. It says this. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human uh, limitations, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and ever increasing wickedness. That's an incru- really, there's a lot of words there. Paul used a lot of words, but if you go down, so there's these two paths there's righteousness and there's selfishness. Righteousness is I'm going to do life God's way, and selfishness is I'm going to do life however I want. I'm going to be the king of my life, I'm going to do it however I want. The problem is that this side, whatever it is you're going after on this side, you have to get more of it. It's called chasing the high. Have you ever heard anybody say that? If it's over here, if it's money, I think it's going to be, I'd have more and more money. There'll never be enough money. If it's sexual experiences, yeah, I'll have to have it more and more and more and more. You just got to keep chasing it. Ever increasing wickedness. And one day you find yourself doing things you never dreamed you'd ever do, but it's because you chose this path over here. And you didn't understand what true freedom was. It goes on. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. One of the phrases we use around here a lot is we live differently. You know what that word means, that phrase means? Holiness. I want my life to be what God wants it to be because he knows better than me. I don't want to be on this path. I want to be on that path. I want to be on the path to righteousness, to holiness. Next section here. It goes on. He says, what ben-, and this is just brutal, but it's true. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed? Anybody ashamed of anything you did before you met Jesus? Just me? I'm the only one. Lying is a sin. (laughs) Those things result in death. This whole path over here, this whole increasingly wicked path, it's death. It doesn't get you where you want to go. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. It's a whole different outcome. We live differently because we have a different outcome. We think differently because we have a different outcome. We choose, we react differently because we have a different outcome. Next section, please. Here's what it says in verse 23. Here's a really interesting thing. It's about these two paths. Paul's laying out these two paths. Path of righteousness, path of selfishness, sinfulness, of the flesh, he calls it. For the wages... Of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's laying out two words. You want to live and get what you deserve? Wages are what you get paid for the work you do. You want to live a selfish life? You'll get, you'll get the wages. You'll get paid. Paid back, if you will. You want to get paid back? Or do you want a gift that you can never earn? Do you want the consequences of your own actions, the life you build, the life you lead, the eternity you choose? Or do you want one you don't deserve? from a loving loving Heavenly Father who wants to gift you something else. See, Paul is saying this humbling thing that we don't deserve the gift that God has given us. And so when we come to realize what it means to be a Christian, we begin to realize that the thing we've wanted all along, we thought was freedom from restriction or from supervision, whatever we thought it was, is really we wanted something to live for or more accurately, someone to live for. And then we come to grips with how we react to not only our, our, those kinds of thoughts, but even our, even our temptations. So in, in chapter 7, um, even though we, we come to this place and we choose the path of righteousness, I want, God, I want you to be charge of my life. Jesus, forgive me my sins. Please help me live for you. But it's still a struggle because we still got this battle going on. So let's look at 14 and 15. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Truer words, I've never identified with Paul more than when he wrote that right there. I am unspiritual. My wife is more spiritual than me. Most of you are more spiritual than me. I am unspiritual. And I meet people, oh, do you you have a faith? Oh, I'm very spiritual. We'll see. He says this, and then he says, because he's just saying this is the truth about me. And then he says, um, uh, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I have, what I hate, I do. Anybody ever been on a diet? That's it right there. That's it. I want to do this. I want to live a righteous life. I don't want to eat that stuff, but somebody put cookies in my office. I mean, theoretically didn't happen this morning or anything. 
get thee behind me, Satan. But anyway, <laughs> let's go to the next section here. The, and, and this, so Paul says, I'm unspiritual. It's the truth about Paul. Well, if Paul's unspiritual, I'm probably pretty unspiritual, right? He goes on. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Now, here, here's the interesting thing. So much of this passage, if you've read this passage, you know that Paul talks about the law, which is like the shorthand, the rules of the Old Testament. But the law he's talking about here is not the rules of the Old Testament. The law he's talking about here is the internal um, fallenness of humankind. It's as if I'm not really in control of me. It's as if there's somebody else has moved in and is really calling the shots. It might be through my urges, through conventional wisdom. It might be false narratives, but somebody else keeps driving me to do something. And not literally, but it feels that way. So it's our fallenness, our fallen nature. Uh, by the way, have you seen the, the predicament that people who rent their homes out are in these days with squatters? Have you seen this? You don't know about it. It's a terrible thing in California. Is it, uh, it's, uh, squatters will move in. The uh, house is empty between, between renters or the people leave or whatever. And, and the squatters move in and you can't get them out. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I saw one, this guy, he, somebody moved into his, his, his house, uh, his rental home or something, and he couldn't get him out legally, so he just moved in. One day they went to the store and he moved in. He said, they're going to hate living with me. They are going to hate it. I'm going to find everything that bugs them and I will drive them out. And I said, well, that's evil, but I kind of like it. Um, <laughs> So there is within us this fallen nature, this desire-driven, urge-driven part of us that's a squatter. And, and it's kind of in there. And every time we want to go for righteousness, the squatter goes, nope, we're going this way. Every time I want to do what's right, the squatter goes, nope, we're going over here. And the squatter's been there a long time. And you're really familiar with the squatter's voice. At one point, you really liked the squatter. He led you some great places. And then at all, you had to wake up the next morning. It was bad. And so what happens here is you've got to, you've got to, get the squatter out, but you got to recognize he's there first, okay? I'm not saying some entity. I'm just saying that fallen part of your nature. So it goes on. Um, where did we stop? Where are you waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me? <laughs> this is where I really identify with Paul again. What a wretched man I am. Poor Paul. He had such bad self-esteem. <laughs> no, Paul was looking at me mirror going, I'm a chump, man. I am selfish, I am mean, I am hungry, I am... What a bad person Paul was. Paul's just like you. He's just like me. And the sooner we can look in the mirror and go, what a wretched person I am. It's the truth. Let's just be honest about it. Well, deep inside, I'm a good person. No, you're not. You're selfish. Just like me. You're sinful. And if you thought you'd get away with it, you'd do even worse stuff. Let's just be truthful. Until God intervenes in your life. And here you say, well, he hit a low point. No, he, began, he hit a beginning point. He hit a baseline, a foundation. I'm a wretched man, and I can't do a blooming thing about it. God, please help me. See, it's called repentance, by the way. It's a part of every one of us. And if you want to develop a spiritual, if you want to develop a spiritual discipline, read God's word, pray every day, and repent. Now, there you can clap, right there. That's a good one. You can clap in there. You don't want to because you have to repent tomorrow because you didn't mean it. The reality is repenting, God, this is the truth about me. I am so sorry. I am not like Jesus. I am not doing well. I am letting things in. I'm letting lust in. I'm letting worry in. I'm letting bitterness in. But here's what he says. What a wretched man I am. And here's the, here's the powerful part. Where can I find a set of rules that, oh no, it's not what he says. Where, where, where can I just find a magic? No, that's what he says. Here's what he says. Who will rescue me? What he knows is he can't fix it. There's no philosophy. There's no set of rules. It's a who. It's a somebody. It's a relationship that will rescue him. That's what he knows. And then we move to verse 1 of chapter 8. And watch this. He's just admitted the truth. I am a wretched man. And here's what it says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So it's not like oh, I'm a wretched man. God goes, yes, you are. You little punk. How dare you? God doesn't do that. God says, yeah, I, I knew that all along. I'm glad you finally realized it. Now let's get to work on this thing. Yeah, you, yeah, you are messed up. You've made some bad decisions. You got some bad stuff in there. You got some bad habits in your brain. You got some stuff, but we're going to fix it. See, that's the beauty of coming to the end of myself and saying, okay, God, I'm done. I can't even clean myself up. You don't clean yourself up to come to God. You come to God to get cleaned up. 
There is no condemnation. There's no embarrassment before God. God already knew it. You're not telling me anything he doesn't know. He's just glad you finally woke up so you're ready to do something about it. Some of us just live in, I don't know, the sewage of our own thoughts, our own actions, our own behavior. And God's going, can I just lift you up out of that? Would you mind? If you just admit where you had and ask for my help, there's no condemnation. There's only hope. There's only forgiveness. There's only joy. There's only forward. Powerful thing. It goes on in verses 5 through 8. He says this. Those who live according to the flesh. Now, here's an interesting thing. According to, in accordance with. It is the, uh, I, I, wanna, the I, I wrote this down. The regulating principle of our lives. What is the regulating principle of your life? What do you live every day by? I've chosen the kingdom's way and God's help. Or I've chosen my way. What is the regulating principle every day in how you react to people, in how you react to injustice, in how you re- react to those you not only dislike, you can't stand? How, what is the regulating principle? He gives, you, he gives you the options again. He says here, those who live according to the flesh, that's this selfish side here, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit, ah, there's the key. How do we live in this path? We choose it, but how do we live it out? Because we don't even have the power to do that. The Spirit. God sends his Holy Spirit to empower us. Not only brings us peace beyond understanding, he empowers us to live differently. He says, the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. Every day we get up and say, God, my life is yours. I read your word, I pray, and I say, God, my life is yours. Please allow your Spirit to guide me today. It's an amazing way to live your life, by the way. I, you're going, well, what does he say? Does he go like, hey, turn right? No, but somehow I'm going down the road and I feel like I'm supposed to go this way. Then later I'm supposed to have this conversation. Later I kind of pass up on an opportunity to be offended. It's hard to do, you know. So many of them. And by the end of the day I go, you know what? I think I, I, think I lived on this path over here. I think the Spirit guided me today. I, I think I made better decisions. I think I had better reactions. I think I had a sweeter spirit about me. That was the work of the Holy Spirit because I invited the Spirit to determine what was going to be the regulating principle of my day and not the anger, not the, the frustration or anxiety or whatever might be around me. And then uh, if we just go on. He says, the mind is governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Isn't that what we want, life and peace? He goes on. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile to God. So those who choose the path of their own choosing, their own selfishness, is hostile to God. Would that explain anything that's happening in the world right now? Would that explain anything you're observing in the world you live in? Not only are they hostile to God, it goes on. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Sometimes I catch myself expecting people who don't know Jesus to act like Jesus. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be happening. And it's not a surprise. Give me the next passage, please. For those who are led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God, are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you're, so it's from have to to want to. Watch this. So, from, say, so that you live in fear again. So before you had fear, fear of missing out, fear of not getting the next thing, fear of somebody taking your stuff, fear of what's happening in the world. Before you lived in fear because you served the flesh. But now as you serve God, it changes from, from uh, I'm enslaved to this. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You are adopted into sonship. And by the way, there's a reason it's, it's masculine. And I don't have time to go into it. It's a great sermon, by the way. Look up Tim Keller. He's got a sermon on it. It's great. There's a reason for that because it has to do with inheritance. So all, male and female, are, have a position able to inherit. Does that make sense? It says, Abba, Father. So what, so let me just finish with this. If we boil this thing down, what is it, what is it really saying? And that's about three quarters of the dump load. I'm just going to finish with this. In chapter eight, it says this, um, in verse 18, 
These are things. You may want to memorize these. The first one is this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy, uh, worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The glory that will be revealed in us. Now, this word in can also be to us. It's both. It can be revealed to us and in us. When I was growing up, there was a, there was a, a song we used to sing, um, it will be worth it all when I see Jesus. There is this sense in which whatever we go through in life, you're not going to get what you're looking for completely in life because what you're looking for is to be back in the garden with your creator. And it's not until you die and are reconciled physically with God that you will realize that everything you've been through here was worth it. The glory that will be revealed to you, who God is and what he's prepared for you and in us by who we become in walking with God. You will be there with God and you will go, oh, this is amazing. And after a few thousand years of of knowing who God is, you'll say, well, what about this in my life? And you you might look back and go, oh, I see God's redemptive plan coming through and leading me here. And it was affecting these, and I never knew. The glory that will be revealed in us, who we've become and what God releases to us. It's a powerful thing. Let's go to the next one. Romans 8, 28, very familiar. If you haven't memorized this, you need to. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, all things means bad things are going to happen to you. They will. God never promises bad things won't happen to you. Bad things will happen to you, around you. And yet in all things, God, not you work it out, not you figure it out, not you make something of it. All things, God works for the good of those who love him and live according to his purposes. And the next one is in 831. And it says this, what then shall we say in response to these things? Here it is, here it is. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? If You're not getting it. If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, there's a whole lot of Christians. There's a whole lot of Christians. A whole lot of Christians walking around going, oh, it's a terrible world. They hate us. They call us bigoted. If God is for us, who can be against us? Here's what I know. Here's what I know. You can call into the, you can crawl if you're a Christian. And if you're not, today's a great day to come to believe in Jesus. Crawl into his lap. Abba, Dad, Abba, Father, crawl into his lap, get close to his heart. And when he is holding you there, safe and secure, he will say, what do you need? You see, something my little granddaughter doesn't know is that, is that when I'm holding her and something scares her and she leans into my heart, she doesn't know. She just instinctively thinks I'm going to help, but she doesn't know the reality. The reality is, if something bad happens, I will give my very life to protect her. If there is a train coming, I will throw her aside and I will take the hit. If somebody tries to hurt her, I will take them down. If something bad is about to happen, she has no idea how much I love that little squirt. She has no idea. And you have no idea how much God loves you. And if you decide to go out there and be tough and do it on your own in the big bad world, why would you do that? There's a God who loved you so much that he died for you. That he came to die for you. If you're trying to make it through and be brave, you know, walking through the dark and whistling as you go, thinking this is the right thing to do, God's going, but I'm right here. I want to, I want to hold your hand. I want to walk you through this. I don't want you to just get through it. I want you to be victorious in the middle of it because a whole bunch of people watching who need the same thing that I'm trying to give you. If you would just stand up and trust me. Here's what I know. If you're like me, it's good. You like it. Oh, that's great. But there's something you're hiding there's some little place of worry or anxiety in your life. There's some little thing that keeps sneaking back in and you haven't given it to God yet. It might be the protection of your children. It might be a woundedness in a relationship. It might be a worry about the financial future or the global future for that matter. There's plenty to worry about. Some little worry, some little anxiety has just found a little foothold of you and taken up residence. It's a little squatter in your soul, in your spirit somewhere. And the Heavenly Father says, come on up here. Let's talk about this. We're going to deal with that. We're going to pull that splinter out. So my question today is, can you walk out of here victorious or are you holding something back? 
Because you have the opportunity right now. Just give it to him. Let him remove it. Let him replace it with the the peace that we talked about, with the perseverance you're going to need to go forward and the power that he will use in and through your life to bring change. You don't have to walk out of here defeated by anything. God is greater. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Lord God, today I am so glad that you are for us. I am so glad that I don't have to face this world or even my own self by myself. Lord God, you are good. You are good and you are powerful. And Lord God, you want more for us. You want us, Lord God, to give ourselves to you, to entrust ourselves to you, to allow you by your spirit to work in us and through us. You are on the throne. Please be on the throne of our lives every day, all day, all the time. Let us walk out with our heads high, knowing that we are friends. No, we are heirs the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Thank you guys for being here. Have a great week. God bless.